Julie, one, one of the things that we are concerned about as historians of women is finding sources that actually speak to the experiences of women. And the Leffitt's papers, which you have here, do that. Could you tell us a little bit about the collection to begin with, and then we'll take a look at some pieces of it? It's one of the reasons why the Lefferts collection became one of my favorites almost as soon as I began working at BHS is because unlike so many other archival collections, it offers this really wonderful concrete glimpse into the experiences of women's lives, women's roles in their family, women's roles in family production um, in a way that so many other collections seem to be missing. The Lefferts papers, which actually are cobbled together from many different acquisitions that were brought to BHS over the years, um, reveal the role of this family in building Brooklyn, but also the role of women in building this family. Well, let's take a look at the recipe book that's sitting in front of us. and. Uh, what I want to ask you is a whole series of complicated questions, not only about who wrote this recipe book over how many years, but who it was meant for and who was going to be cooking from the recipes. That's a great question, Alice. And I mean, the first thing to know about this book, if we looked at our finding aid, it's a 19th century book. But it contains information that is much older than that. These are recipes that would have been handed down over generations, um, that would have been taught from mother to daughter. And those would have been Lefferts mother to daughter, but also mother to daughter for the enslaved people who lived with and served the Lefferts. So by a couple generations into their arrival in Brooklyn, in an area now known as Flatbush, they would have amassed a good deal of enslaved African servants who would have been doing the majority of cooking for them. And are you saying that the enslaved African Americans in Brooklyn would, were literate, could read and write, unlike Southern enslaved? That's also an interesting question. We don't know about this particular family, but what we do know more broadly is that many of the enslaved people coming to Brooklyn in the 17th and 18th century learned to speak and, in some cases, write multiple languages. In Brooklyn, this would have been significant because Brooklyn had a a tenacity with their Dutch culture and their Dutch language that you don't necessarily see in other places in what is now Greater New York City. There were communities, especially in what we now think of as Outer Borough Brooklyn, that were speaking Dutch into the 18th century and still bringing over their Dutch burgers to preach in church from mm. Europe. So Dutch, the Dutch language hung on here um, for a, just up until the American Revolution. And so the enslaved people who were reading this cookbook would have been fluent in both English and in well, Dutch? Well, enslaved people would not have been reading this book because this was probably produced in the middle of the 19th century, after slavery ends in New York State. Mm. Likely, these recipes would have just been passed down orally when it was enslaved people cooking these recipes, because after all, that servant would likely stay with you for most of their life. So that kind of written record would have been less necessary than it becomes in the 19th century. Right. Uh, take a look at some of the recipes for us and tell us what it is that they're actually cooking. Absolutely. I mean. Well, in the front of this book, we see that there is a nice little key, um, a table of contents, if you will, which is one of the pieces of evidence that we have that this is not something that has been, you know, casually written down over time, this book was, sitting, sat, was written from beginning to end and they created a table of contents at the beginning. We see evidence of their Dutch culture. We see ole cakes here. This is a, a well-known Dutch dish. We see crullers. We see waffles. But we also see evidence of the local fare that would have begun to influence the way that they ate once they arrived in Brooklyn. A lot of stuff with oysters in it and a lot of stuff with corn in it, and a remarkable number of recipes that begin with the word Indian. Mm, isn't that interesting? And the recipes themselves, are they of the kind that um, we might make today? I think in some cases, you know, these there are cakes in here, you see a um, emphasis more on baking than on cooking in this. What I think is very different than today is the scale um, by which people were baking. So here's a recipe for sponge cake that calls for seven pounds of flour. 
Right. That's a significant amount of flour. That's a big sponge cake. That's a big sponge cake, or, <laughs> or many, or sponge many sponge cakes. cakes. Exactly. So the idea would have been to bake in large quantities and then store. The That's right. To bake for cakes. scale. So w they certainly were baking for a bigger family, for a bigger group of mouths than maybe our traditional nuclear family today. But they would all also have been looking to bake over time, and you see that to be especially the case with things like pudding um, or jams that would have preserved quite. Well. Right. So when I flip through this uh, recipe book, uh, I notice that you can read the lives of women into some of the recipes, that they and their household helpers, free or enslaved, are cooking for large numbers of people, that they're cooking in quantity for the future, not just for the present that the recipes are relatively simple, two or three ingredients, four, five, you know, but no huge numbers of ingredients, mm -hmm. and very limited kinds of spices, things to sort of tempt the palates. These are, um, you might call them sturdy Absolutely. recipes. Absolutely. Flour, sugar, eggs, potatoes. Those right. are the kinds of things that you see in here. Yeah, and I think that really reflects the the somewhat of the isolation that you would have seen in Brooklyn um, up until the early 19th century. Today we think of Brooklyn as just a subway away from Manhattan. Um, that was not the case really until the 1810s and the 1820s when you see the rise of steam ferry. I like to call Colonial Brooklyn a frontier. Mm. There were people who would have lived in, especially in places like Flatbush, further out in Brooklyn, who may never have gone to Manhattan in their entire lives. And so that disconnection from the market, where you would have gotten those kinds of spices, would have certainly affected their lives. Right. So these frontier women, and I like that designation, leave us a record of their lives, in a way, in the products that they Absolutely. cook. Absolutely. But this is a changing time for that family. So one of the reasons why this gets written down at the moment that it does is not because they started cooking these recipes at this point. It's because with the shift away from enslaved labor towards more casual labor, likely they would have had Irish servants serving them by the 1850s. These recipes now need to be written down because you may not have the same person cooking them this year as you might the next. Right. And we notice just finally that the recipes are written in two different hands. That's right. So clearly they're started, well perhaps not so clearly, but they're started by perhaps a mother and then continued by the daughter. We believe that the first handwriting was written by Mariah Lott Lefferts, and then the second handwriting was written by one of my favorite Brooklynites, Gertrude Lefferts Vanderbilt. Mm, wonderful. Thanks, Julie.